And I guess because it's an even-numbered episode that I can do the uh, intro thing. Sounds good. So, and I guess they'll have to deal with, like, fans going. Or, like, maybe... We can slide it away if that, that helps yeah. any. But, Just... like, but like the air conditioning is still on. Yeah. But, I mean, hey, it's summer. So, so do we need a moment of silence to remember those who have fans running? This is Control Structure, episode 112, for July 27th, 2016. Big week to everyone watching us on YouTube. This show has show notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs112 to see them. I am your host, Andrew Bailey, and with me today is the other host, Stephen Orvis. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Steve. So, yeah, uh, I guess we're on YouTube, at least in audio format. I just so, even though apparently our only show up there has zero views, you said? Uh, no views no as views. of, like, recording this right now. <laughs> uh, by the way, this is, like, uh, being recorded live, so just to, like, make sure that we get that out of the way. But, uh, if it's not live and they listen to it? Oh, it's, it, that doesn't matter, it's being recorded live. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, summer is happening. It is happening. Very hot. Uh, by me, it was supposedly like 98 at one point in time. Never hit 100, though. Yeah, um, that's going to be that way for about the rest of the week, uh, which kind of bums me out because um, when it gets like 90 degrees, I feel like, uh, I don't want to like walk down to the T and take the T to work. And I'm like, eh, too hot. Why would I even bother uh, getting on a bicycle and like, you know, riding around? So, uh, yeah, it kind of sucks that way. So, uh, you've broken with your, your, uh, habit of the tea thing and uh, taking the car the past few days then? Um, yeah, for like two weeks. Wow. So, which kind of, you know, again, bums me out. But, um, yeah, hopefully as, uh, cooler weather uh, starts coming in, because, you know, winter is coming, uh, you know, it will, you know, also facilitate an increase in activity. Until it decreases the activity because of the ice and snow, and you're like, I don't want to go walk in the snow and like five degrees below zero wind chill, like fifty below. <laughs> you crazy? Um, have you known me for a while? Yes, I am crazy. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah. So you know that today is International Back of Awareness Day, right? It is every day. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, usually we have this at the end of the show, but, like, going on right now and continuing probably until, like, I go to sleep and even after, uh, I am testing a restore of my backup. So, I think it might have been last episode that uh, I unboxed a 4 terabyte hard drive, and uh, so that's a good size to try to pull off the... Uh, all the data on the 4 terabyte hard drive uh, downstairs through the network. So, uh, if you, uh, like, I've already explained this to you, but BTRFS is a pretty cool file system. Uh, there is a command that you can run called scrub that reads pretty much everything off the uh, file system, verifies the data, because, like, the file system has checksums in it that will, you know, notify and I think maybe even try to correct some of the errors if it encounters any from the disk, uh, like even from the data and the metadata. And before you ask, like, well, how does it know if the metadata is corrupt? It's redundant. It's so it's a good feature when you're storing files. So, and like, uh, have you ever heard the quote, uh, never bring two compasses or like two measuring tools on a ship because if one of them wrong is wrong you don't know which one of them is wrong oh that's i've never heard that one but that that does sound uh, so sound true so from what i've read that there are three copies of like the file structure on a BTRFS system. See, I was thinking the answer to that was just bring one compass on this ship and then you would just be in blissful ignorance. Oh, well, one or three. 
<laughs> one, if you want to be ignorant. Three, if you want to be sure. So that's a lot like uh, the raid. I'm not sure. Five, four, or something like that, where you have three drives. You have two that store like half the data, and like a third drive that does your your checks. I think that's information. five. Yeah, that raid five. Right. It's like more for servers. Because they're in planning, you have like five or something like that, drives or six or yeah. some crazy number of drives. Although, RAID 5 and 6 run into their own issues, so, uh, like, performance type issues, so, um, it's complicated. Despite the hype of RAID, like, it's been used, I feel like, a fair amount in servers, but, like, home users, it's like the computer nerds that do it because it's cool, and everyone else still isn't using it, so... Yeah, um, like, people are, are, you know, insane. It's like, yo, yeah, let's get all these uh, hard drives and put them in RAID. Um, yeah, my solid-state drive beats all of that. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, how about once you RAID all of your solid-state drives together? Um, then M.2 comes along and, like, completely leaps that again. <laughs> so, which is, like, another standard that's not serial ATA. Okay. So... Uh, anyways, uh, so instead of like being all fast, why don't we be all old? Have you ever had a Super Nintendo? Uh, no. Me neither. Uh, maybe a PlayStation? Uh, did you know that the PlayStation was originally supposed to be an add-on for the Super Nintendo? Well, there's only one known prototype in existence, and this thing has been, like, was, uh, like, mythical and, you know, it had been pretty much relegated to, you know, once upon a time. But I think it was last year that someone had come across one in, must have been like a business auction or something. And, uh, you know, kind of came out with it. And uh, it's not working too well, as you might expect. Uh, but uh, Ben Heck, a, I'm not exactly a fan of his. But mostly because I don't really know him or in his work that well. But he apparently, like, fixes and builds things. So he had at this uh, Super Nintendo uh, PlayStation prototype and got it working reasonably well. The only problem is, is that there's no, uh, like, disc-based games for it. Which is kind of the point of having a CD drive in a Super Nintendo. So it theoretically works, but they just can't verify that. So... Uh, apparently, like, the BIOS uh, for this system, maybe not this specific system, but for the system in general, like, the BIOS and the firmware was dumped, and I think someone actually made a game that, in theory, should run on it. Nice. So do you know if they tried it or not? They didn't try it. Not that I know of. That would be the, the interesting test to actually see it play the game. So, and you can tell that this this uh, system is old because it has yellowed plastic everywhere. When I saw that, it reminded me of the old computer we used to have that had Windows 3.1 on it, and it had this giant mechanical keyboard that uh, you could knock someone out with, and it had that yellowed look to the outside case. Yeah. So now for something marginally less obscure... Uh, Sega Saturn. So it had a clever DRM system that had a wavy pattern going around the edge of the game discs. And after 20 years, this has finally been cracked. So, and like, uh, we have it paused there at almost two minutes into this video. You can clear, see a distinct and clear wavy pattern going around the end. And, uh, the hack pretty much involves a video cartridge slot in the back that the guy can pretty much load up ISOs onto a thumb drive and put them in. <laughs> Which is a pretty creative solution to that. I thought the, the DMR was kind of neat just to you put a wavy line. So it's not a digital protection per se. It's so off the charts that it's going to be hard to fix, probably. Yeah, and apparently difficult to fake since it's been 20 years. Mm -hmm. Although it's kind of always been an obscure system because like it was only like the top of the line for like maybe a year or two before it was succeeded by the next generation. And we've always had the next generation of things. <laughs> so, um, yeah, cool things. 
And now for laughs. So I've been reading through a commit strip uh, for, I don't know, two months or so. Because, uh, like, this has been going for a few years. And, you know, it's essentially humor based around programming and stuff. And, you know, you kind of, uh, you know, picked, I don't know, like five or so at random. Yes, I just kind of grabbed a few random ones off the top. Uh, one one good one was he was describing uh, uh, his, uh, the, the function of skill equals salary question mark. And so then he was showing, like, the effectiveness of a developer and how a better developer can, you know, maybe be way faster than a mediocre one. And he's like... More effective. Yeah, more effective. He's like, unfortunately, there isn't a correlation between salary and skill set. And he shows, like, this wavy line that goes all over the place. Which is kind of true. I I feel like developers just kind of get a lot of wide variety of uh, pay ranges there. So, so yeah, it's, uh, you know... Uh, the translations aren't perfect because I'm pretty sure this is like originally in French. Oh, interesting. But some things are just universal. It it is. It's it's very good comic strip, and I like just saw it. Yeah. So uh, let's see. I I want to hesitate and compare it to Penny Arcade, but I'm not exactly too familiar with Penny Arcade. And for, let's see, I don't think you are exactly familiar with those guys. I don't know anything about Penny Arcade. Uh, Do you know about Garfield? Like the comic strip in the newspaper? Yes. It's kind of, Penny Arcade is kind of like the Garfield of the internet. Arduino? 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 Arduino! <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Have Have you ever wanted to have your very own professional grade telescope? Robotic telescope. I'm pretty sure at some point I have, because like I actually have a real telescope that I've used. Okay. But unfortunately, it's pretty much been disassembled for like 10 years. <laughs> So you're like, hmm, I wonder how it works. Take it apart. <laughs> no, well, more or less for storage. Because, uh-huh. like, a telescope, like a proper telescope that you can look through, is, is, well, it has a stand to it, so that takes up a lot of space. So if you, like, disassemble it or collapse it or something, it's a lot better okay, to store. Okay, I see. So uh, the Open Space Agency, which I believe is based in the UK, they are working on designing the Ultrascope. Which is a 3D printed robotic uh, telescope. The concept is most of the parts are 3D printed, so that helps anyone be able to make it. And then, of course, you still do have to buy parts. So I think the figure is something like $325, mm-hmm. roughly, something like that. Uh, and it uses an Arduino to, for the brains part of it, and then for the camera, they just put use a high megapixel smartphone on it. They have mm-hmm. like a mount, kind of like I've seen the 3D printed uh, adapters for your camera phone, so you can put it on a spotting scope before. A similar concept of how they're doing it there. Uh, but kind of the neat thing is they're trying to build a professional, somewhat professional grade uh, telescope that's actually going to be decent with this. And I think it sounds like they're planning and putting it in like a network. Uh, grid so that you can go to different countries and go take a look at different people's uh, skies. And since it's a robotic, you could actually like control it and focus it and spin it around in the sky and look at different things. Uh, I watched a different video the other day than we watched Andrew earlier, and they were talking about in that video that lately there's been a trend of professional grade equipment in the hands of consumers, such as your DSLR digital cameras, mm-hmm. uh, various things like that. And so now this is the the coming to to the world of space now we can have our own professional grade telescope yeah uh, supposedly there is a, in the works for a moon rover too so that one i'm looking so my 3d printed moon rover so like i know it's supposed to be a moon rover but are they like supposed to like put it on the moon 
Because that would be a pretty impressive thing. Th- that would be impressive if they put it on the moon. Uh, the, the, I think it was just an upcoming project, but that that still sounds pretty neat. I mean, the 3D printed moon river, I mean, I'd build that. How about that's, a that's... 3D printer on the moon? Oh, there you go. So we have to 3D print the parts, <laughs> and it would be printed assembled, and so it would work. There you go. So, uh, you know about Microsoft, right? Uh, I, Microsoft. I, the name rings a bell. I've heard of them before, I think. Uh, yeah, they seem to be, like, pretty small because of the name. Because it's just micro software. Yes. Yeah. Just, just the micro section. And, and not, like, you know, KiloSoft or Megasoft. It's definitely not Megasoft. But they are bigger than Nullsoft. They are bigger than Nullsoft. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, they have a lot of books to give away. Um, I, it appears that they do this like maybe once a year or so. Uh, so yeah, this has been going on for like a few weeks now. So, uh, better step up and download all of the things. Or since you already download all the things and have them on your hard drive, hopefully soon I might just borrow them from you. Yes. And it looks like they're already on the, uh, the public share. So, so I, I might copy them off, even though I did notice as I was reading all the titles, all of them are focused on Windows pro- products like Windows 10 or Office 360. I'm like, hmm, just not really that interested in Microsoft. But hey, I'll grab them. Wait, Win- Windows 10? Yes, Windows 10. The upgrade ends in like two days. I know that, and I am not upgrading my Windows 7 install. So, well, I guess you can just be that way, see if I care. I can, because you know what? I bought a license key for Windows 7 off of eBay for like $10, and I upgraded that one, so I have Windows 10 if I want to. But you know what? I'm still using Ubuntu anyways most of the time, so I don't care Microsoft. So, so, uh, speaking for myself, all of my Windows systems are updated, and I don't really have a reason to convert any of my Linux systems to Windows 10. Hey, I even hear that Linux is coming to Windows 10. It is. Sort of. Sort of. Don't you have to, like, enable something, some developer feature? This well, is actually kind of hidden. Well, sort of. But come August 2nd, uh, it'll just come as a regular update. Okay, that's the, not the, quite as bad. The uh, Windows 10 anniversary update, it's being called. Uh, so... Like, uh, you know, like a whole bunch of things are going to be released then. Uh, but, yeah, we're really looking forward to that, uh, you know, the Linux integration stuff. Or the, uh, uh, how did we say, the uh, Linux subsystem for Linux. Yes. <laughs> uh, I think they should make the whole file system path restriction thing be a feature that's turned off by default now. There's no reason why that should be turned on. They should just turn it off. The the what? The, you know, remember, as another part of this update, they have the restriction on 200 and what, 50 oh, and yeah. yeah character. They should just turn that off. Like, it shouldn't be a registry hack. <laughs> so, um, we all love uh, Stack Overflow, right? Oh, this is the best side ever. Funny story. The guy at work wants one of the managers. He's like, and where do you go? He's ta- making some conversation in front of other developers, like, uh, just giving a talk, and... Uh, he he turns and looks at me. He's like, "Where do you go when you need help? And you you know on the internet for like C sharp questions and stuff." And he he wants me to say MSDN. That's what he wants me to say. And I look back at like Stack Overflow every time. And he's like, "Really? <laughs> like yeah? It's just better." <laughs> so, anyways, to answer your question, Andrew, Stack Overflow. So, uh, turns out that. In addition to already being a de facto repository for documentation, they're actually launching a site specifically to be documentation. It's an interesting concept because it's true. People, that's like standard. Like you don't just give a link to the answer in Stack Overflow. They want you to actually spell out the answer and then give a link to your source so that the source goes down. Your answer is still preserved of what, how to fix the problem. I... I look briefly at some of the documentation, and I see how it can go good, but a little concerned, too, in that is the Stack Overflow itself is more natural to produce content, whereas this seems like it's going to be less natural to produce content. Yeah. But it may avoid duplication of content, which could be good. Yeah, and then uh, uh, I've heard of a, a, of a potential downside to this in that, like, a small-time open-source project... Uh, might have documentation 
on the the Stack Overflow site instead of like the official documentation on like their wiki or wherever. So you're saying that the the users would be creating this documentation, or you saying that they they wouldn't bother with their own? Do they just go making a Stack Overflow? Uh, the latter. So they just go to Stack Overflow and create the documentation there instead of contributing back to the uh, like the, their official documentation wherever it might be. For some, oh, you so know. you're saying the users of it aren't yeah. producing. That, that's true. I see that. I see also see companies maybe uh, like smaller ones just from the get go. Maybe they might like, hey, we started documentation on Stack Overflow. Hope other people will edit it and help us. And now everyone knows. Well, where do I go for my documentation? Obviously, Stack Overflow. Yeah, that, that could work too. So, mm-hmm. and then like the thing that you know they want people to cite their answers. It's like, well. They can put it on this documentation site and link back to it. <laughs> it's like in Wikipedia once, my uh, brother wanted to. Uh, it was for World of Tanks, the, some, the Blitz, the mobile device version of it, and like it was supposed to come out at a such and such a date, but it didn't. And so the Wikipedia article still said the date from the past, and so he he's tried to edit it out because it obviously didn't happen. And it's like, well, you need a source to cite it. So we made a website really quick. <laughs> we back to the Wikipedia <laughs> article that says such and such said that. Then we linked the Wikipedia article to the site. The link actually stayed up for a little while. It was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, I've, I think I've actually come across like some kind of comic about that. Yes, but... which is probably where I got the idea to do such a thing. <laughs> Just to drive somebody crazy someplace. So, um, hey, we were talking about file systems earlier. Yes. So apparently NTFS has a uh, somewhat unused feature uh, that's called data streams. It makes a file have different data depending on how you look at it. And by how you look at it, I mean like a different stream in that file. Due to differences in allowed characters between Windows and not Windows systems that Git runs on, Git can make these alternate data streams indiscriminately. I found this interesting because I've actually hit uh, issues with Git and Windows before, whereas, uh, you know, Windows, a capital S, T, less than the spell of man name, file, is equivalent to all uppercase Steven. Uh-huh. But in Linux... Two totally different files. I've hit issues before where a file got renamed in the repository, and like Windows, for some reason, was thinking it's the same name. Gets like, no, it's different. And so you actually end up in the Git repository with uh, the file can't it can't create the different file, but Windows says the other files are already there, and gets like frustrated. So it has <laughs> it's it gets really weird and tough to fix. But I've seen stuff like this before. And this one, it looked like what it was. There's a colon in the file name caused yes. it. Yes, so how these alternate data streams are specified is with a colon. So if you make a file foo, foo comma, or foo comma, foo colon bar in a repository, then you put that into Windows, uh, a file named foo will be written with a data stream of bar. I thought that was interesting, just the concept of you have uh, in the example screenshot there that they had in the article, you see uh, S, or uh, not S, dollar sign data, and that's yeah. like the actual data of the file, and then underneath it you see bar, and it has a length of six of their tests that well, they wrote. And by actual data, you mean like the default data stream. The default data stream. The thing you think about when you're going to write to a file, the thing that actually happens. Uh, so that was interesting. So these data streams aren't really used that much anymore. But except for web browsers that mark them uh, as downloaded so that the Windows security system will treat them differently. So if you've ever downloaded an a, uh, install file and then you try to run it, uh, Windows will say, you know, uh, hang on, this file was downloaded from the Internet. Do you really want to run this? Yes, I've seen that before. And I want to say it was in around Windows XP, which would fit the whole NTFS standard about that period in time well uh, ntfs actually goes back to i think probably windows nt 3.5 yes but windows 98 wasn't using it it was correct that 32 yeah oh, you and me i believe supported ntfs mm, I, 
maybe? Mm, yeah, I don't, I don't think so, since Windows ME was like essentially like an offshoot of 95, or in 98, uh, whereas, you know... For some reason, I thought it did, but let's look and see. Maybe it's just a hack if it does support it. It looks like it might be the case. Is uh, Okay. But, uh, you know, NT, 2000, XP, Vista, etc. Not running ME. Okay, so Windows ME officially didn't support NDFS, and if there's hacks out there to do it, it wasn't like an official deal. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure how... Uh, this could be resolved aside from don't use colons in your file names. He did suggest a basically that fix of to to get repository to to stop them from making that file because it's just likely to cause issues to like, somebody else. Like a commit hook or something. Uh, I didn't actually read what he did, but it's his verbally what he described his fix was to just stop them from committing it to the repository. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, of, I want to say a few weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, uh, that the code for the Apollo Guidance computer was uh, posted on GitHub, and there was a whole bunch of uh, splash made around it. So, this is the code that brought people to the moon. I, I was hearing quite a bit about it. The only thing, though, is that it's all an assembler, so I don't know why it... I mean, I, I get that it's cool, that it was stuff from you know, taking us to the moon. But it's not near as interesting to read as... Like, this well commented, I'll give him that. But it's not near as interesting to read as, like, say, the, the DOS 1.0 code and stuff like that. Or, like, the donkey game or something. Oh, the, the one that, that Bill Gates wrote? Yeah. <laughs> Love that one. Love that one. But, yeah, still kind of neat and cool and stuff if you have whatever kind of computer that Apollo 11 was in the spaceship <laughs> to go with it. I totally would use this. I'd clone this puppy and use it. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, for a little bit of background information, uh, I found an interview with Margaret Hamilton. Uh, she was actually the team lead of the team that actually wrote all of this. And apparently there's a lot of code because, like, there's a whole pile of books, and she's standing right next to it. <laughs> that would be uh, quite a bit of code. So, I wonder, like, how many, like, kilobytes of information is, like, right there. Like, that should be, like, several megabytes. Like, more than what should be possible to be stored on a computer back in the 60s. Uh, there's a photo I saw once of Bill Gates holding up a CD-ROM. And below him is this huge stack of paper, and he's like suspended from a like a, a climbing harness up way up high in the street. And he's like this big grin on his face because at CD ROM holds that huge stack of paper. I'm trying to find the photo because it's interesting. Uh, holding CD above stack of paper. But that reminded me of that and all the all the oh wait wait this is it this is oh, it oh yeah. You see, it's massive, massive stack of paper. How do you do a photo shoot like that? How do you spend that much time doing a photo shoot like that? It's like, now, wow. And okay. that looks like uh, they, that was, looks like they uh, didn't have drones back then. It does look like they didn't have drones back then. I mean, it would have been so much easier now. They, they probably had the camera from the crane he was dangling from. That probably could be it. Um, would actually, you could for the link? The link would be better. Okay, we will put in the link then. Here is the link. I actually uh, thought of a somewhat useful uh, use for a drone the other day. Uh, we heard something hit the roof. We have a steel roof. And uh, I was thinking that if I had a camera drone, uh, that I could fly above our roof and disinspect it for damage or whatnot and see what was up there instead of us getting a ladder out and going and looking on the steel roof because they're dangerous anyways because you could slide off and all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, anyways... So, uh, HTTPS usage has gone way up in the past year. I wonder why. 
Hmm, did, did anything happen that, like, it was easier to adopt it or cheaper or something? Maybe? Yeah, I think there, it might have been, like, automated or something. Automated? That that, that makes things easier. I, I know it was, like, two words or something, and it seemed like it was, a, like, a command to do something, like, let something. Um, let's, like, let's secure... Let's secure it all! No, that's, that's too many words. Encrypt it. You want to encrypt it? Let's encrypt! That's a great name. Yes! Like, we should totally do this. Let, let's Google it. Let's make sure the name's not already taken. <laughs> so, let's encrypt. Ah, it's already taken. It looks like someone's already doing this. Wow. Free SSL slash DSL has certificates. Free, automated, and open. Get started now. So, um... And uh, what I think it might have been last episode or the episode before that we talked about how uh, Let's Encrypt is encrypting so many certificates. It's like something like 40% of the internet or something. Which is a lot of the internet. So, like, this substantial increase kind of makes sense with all of that. And uh, so, uh, let's see. Yeah, it, it more than doubled. Uh, so uh, this chart shows the stunning growth in adoption over the past year. From the for the top one million sites, the share grew from about two point nine percent last August to nine point six percent now. Uh, looking at the top ten thousand, adoption grew from six point three percent to twelve point eight percent. So it seems like the past twenty years, uh, at least like since HTTPS uh, as a standard was implemented. Like, for the past 20 years, you know, growth was okay, but just in the past year, it more than doubled. Interesting is previously, it was actually, according to the green line there from understanding the top 100k, 10k rather, yeah. it was went down just for a few months there. Unless it was people who knew it was coming, so they're like, let's hold off, don't buy it, we're just going to get the freebie in a little while. Uh, it might have been an anomaly, uh... You know, like counting anomaly. I don't know. It's it's pretty sharp down. It's hard yeah. to say though. But uh, yeah, this is uh, pretty cool. So uh, yeah, it's pretty easy to do that. Uh, figure out how to shove HTTP, HTTPS certificates into your server, and uh, you know, it's not that hard, honestly. So and it works on non-standard ports. Huh. Uh, but it's not a cure-all, so the URL can be intercepted through some malicious proxy setups when you're using HTTPS. Uh, this affects pretty much every browser on every platform. So uh, there's an attack called Unholy PAC, or Unholy PAC, but it's not the political action committee or anything. It's like a proxy something something, proxy autoconfig file. Uh, which specifies the types of URLs that should trigger the use of a proxy. So when you go to like a free Wi-Fi location or like Wi-Fi anywhere, DHCP can be used to set up a proxy server that browsers will use when trying to, you know, go somewhere like request a URL. So if a URL apparently matches one of these entries in this proxy autoconfig, that it will send the uh, URL in plain text to this supposed proxy. And I guess if it doesn't work, then the browser will try the normal way. But, like, that still exposes your supposedly secure URL. So that gives them a chance to do a man-in-the-middle attack, attack, make their own connection with the server you want, and then serve you your data back? Uh, mm, sort of. But this is, like, more concerning, like, oh, you forgot your password, so here's a URL you can use to reset your password. Uh, and, uh, like, even open ID uh, type of things. Or was it OAuth or something? But, yeah, uh, with this attack, your URLs are not secure as you think they are. Um, but, uh, surprisingly, Internet Explorer 11 and Microsoft Edge invoke the find proxy for URL function for URLs that are truncated to host names only, as opposed to full URLs, which may contain authentication tokens or credentials. So, uh, surprise, like, Microsoft browsers have actually thought about this. 
So like it'll actually test the host name instead of the full URL uh, for like these proxy things. It's very impressive for such a small software company that they are so famous for IE being so insecure that they've actually made beat everyone else. That's impressive. Yeah. Uh, I think this might be more of an accident, though. Could be. <laughs> like, Whoo! I'm glad we did that one. I'm sure they're all breathing relief right now. So, hey, uh, speaking about this tiny little company, uh, so we've been talking, I'd say for years, about how the U.S. government wanted Microsoft to, uh, I want to say, like, hand over emails from uh, a server in Ireland. But the U.S. authorities wanted these emails due to some, I think, drug prosecution case. But Microsoft's like, hold on, like, you're requesting information that resides outside of your jurisdiction. We don't think so. So, uh, apparently, the previous ruling has been overturned, which said that they had to provide that data. And now the courts are saying, yeah, you're right, you're, you know, you don't need to hand over this data since it actually resides outside of the United States. Um, so the Stored Communications Act, which allows domestically held data to be handed over, does not apply outside of the United States. They had a good, uh, the art court did had a, a good example of why they logically thought this. In their example or something like, we suppose there's a bank in Ireland and they happen to have an office in New York City and in there there's a safety deposit box and say a news reporter has some information that the authorities want in Ireland. So this is like the Ireland coming to that bank and being like, hey, give us the master key to that box. We're going to look in it and rifle through the reporter's uh, papers. Uh, instead, the proper approach would be to go through the U.S. channels and like, look, we're doing this and that and you, you need to help us. Uh, so I thought that was a good example of why they logically reasoned it as wrong. And to the point uh, in the article, they said that the government could have uh, gone through proper channels through Ireland to get this data already. Had they uh, actually done that, they'd have it by now instead of having this court case with denial and not getting any place. So, yeah, apparently America's ex you know reach doesn't exactly go overseas. Which is good. It's... There's been a lot of cases like this recently. Recently, they've keep trying to uh, see how far they can push things, how much they can get into your private data. Yeah. So it's good that rules are being applied and people are using common sense. That's great. Uh, you know what else is great? CSS. Apparently, you can do some neat tricks that don't need JavaScript. And uh, so you were looking at this before. I, I did look at it before. Uh, it's got some interesting things. One of the most interesting ones is it's actually got like this uh, game where they just have the character the, like spaceships on your mouse and they move around and they try to hit you as you fly by which is creative. And then there's a, a grid that they did and it follows your mouse yeah. on the grid and they did it, it like 500 div cells. They <laughs> like made up a grid of the divs and then like you move your mouse and it would figure out where your mouse was and then make this dot follow your mouse around. <laughs> So it's creative stuff. Like, that one was a little kind of a hack, but I, I, I see what they're doing there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, some but, stuff in here. But uh, the thing that intrigued me most is, uh, like, a tab pane that uh, you can actually get some fancy selectors and attach labels to hidden radio buttons and uh, have, like, a tabs, you know, going. So you could have, like, one single web page, and then you have different content on the web page for yeah. different tabs. Yeah, so you can, like, click this text, and, like, the thing below it will change. So that uh, sounds useful, given your recent enthusiasm for single-page applications. It does. So uh, my tea time uh, timetables... Uh, I pretty much have been, like, revising this, like, kind of uh, obsessively uh, for, like, about a week or two. Uh, so if you look at my Git history, you can see... <laughs> it has been. So, uh, yeah, I've been obsessively uh, looking at this, figuring out how I can make it to load faster. Uh, so the most obvious would be is to reduce the amount of data being loaded on the page. 
So, like, I kind of, you know, like, swapped a few things around in the data model, made things less redundant, and, like, chopped off seconds, because, like, I don't show seconds on the timetables. Uh, so, I'm... I think I might have got... shaved the data model itself less than, say, 50%. That's a pretty good increase to, to get that much of a savings. So did you do like performance tests like before and after? What kind of uh, time savings that gave you? Yes, at least on desktop. But the ideal environment for this is on a phone. Because like you're not exactly toting around a laptop to a yeah, to, not. to a light rail station. So um, you know, as you can see here if you go to the inspect element you see a whole bunch of labels and radio buttons. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, it's looking pretty sweet. And I also put in a few gradients and, uh, uh, like, highlighted every other row a little bit. Yeah, it does look good, the, like, the different gradients there, because it helps you see which lines up with which it, it does make it easier. I'm noticing a, a similar style to your, to your website. You've done a similar theme you've pulled off, making it look like your website. Yeah, my blog. Yes. Yes. Uh, that was kind of intentional. So, uh, but the text is actually white here. Mm -hmm. So, instead of that teal, cool color. So, I don't think that we got any podcast feedback uh, for a while. Uh, but uh, since we are on YouTube, I'd like to thank all the people I yeah, use music from, like Anatech, Big Giant Circles, C418, Celestial Eon Project, DMASC, um, let's see, I was, I had a nice alphabetical order going there, but, uh, uh, Life Formed, uh, like, especially the, uh, like, the Double Fine Adventure soundtrack, uh, which, uh, as a plug, I finally reviewed Broken Age Act 2, uh, or at least Part 2, or whatever, uh, so, like, I'm sort of going through my backlog of games from last year to write blog posts about because like, I haven't been doing that for a while. Uh, also, uh, uh, back to the music, uh, Triad and Unat, especially Unat for the, uh, whatchamacallit, the intro I've been using for like ever. Uh, so yeah, if you would like to submit feedback, go to the nexus.tv and click on the feedback link. And uh, as mentioned, today is International Backup Awareness Day. And it looks like the backup test is maybe 50% complete. So, um, yeah, as mentioned, I will be uh, playing video games and reviewing them for a while. Uh, what about you? Well, I've uh, still been doing the blacksmithing thing. Uh, I actually made a shepherd's crook holder or ornament thing. Can you speak into the Microsoft? I Yes, I can speak into the Microsoft. <laughs> I made this shepherd's hook thing the other day. The idea is it goes in the ground, and then uh, you can hang something like, say, a wreath or something off of it. Uh, so so it has like a little arch and then like a hook at the end? Yeah, basically, yep, yep. D just like a small one. Put some twist in it. Yeah, I uh, think my mom has one of those in the yard somewhere. Yeah. So, a uh, more simple project. I did do some welding with a forge the other day, which was interesting because you have like these uh, hot sparks of metal and stuff flying off, and I embedded metal into my palm of my hand, <laughs> which was really hot. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Anyways, but yeah, lots of fun, lots of dangerous. It's not fun if it's not dangerous. <laughs> I might try making a knife soon. I have some spring steel, which is supposed to be high carbon, which you need for knives. So, I'm thinking. Just make the shape, quench it in oil, and see if it comes out. Not like know too much about it, and try and see if that works. Maybe don't know. Cool. So, um, yeah, sounds good. So, have a good one. You too.